Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 332 of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearmsauctions.com, where you set the price on guns, ammo, and accessories. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. Our theme today is an American Olympian. And our guest is Lanny Barnes. Lanny is... Oh, I'm sorry. Lanny is a three-time Olympian biathlon and Um, is a national and world champion in several shooting disciplines. Lanny is currently teaching courses to military, law enforcement, and competitive shooters on the psychological and physiological aspects of shooting. Lanny and her sister, her twin sister, Tracy, spend a majority of their free time traveling around to schools, 4-H clubs, and boys and girls clubs, talking to children about following their dreams and setting goals and leading a healthy, active lifestyle. And if all of that isn't enough to fill a calendar, Lanny also takes wounded vets and terminally ill children on hunts through Freedom Hunters and OA for a o e for a welcome to the show miss lanny thank you guys so much for having me i absolutely love you guys it's so much fun listening to you guys talk and and i love what you do thank you thank you so much and and right back at you and um just for for myself even included what is o e for a o e for a is outdoor experience for all I love it. So uh, when uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation kicked out all of the hunting, shooting, fishing type activities that kids, terminally ill kids wanted to do uh, because it was too politically incorrect, uh, several organizations like OE4A picked them up and, and uh, started making and granting those wishes for ter- terminally ill kids. How did you, how, Lady, how did you get involved in that? Uh, I've been involved in a lot of different organizations as far as wounded vets and, and uh, a lot of different children's organizations. And, and I met the, the man, Eddie Corona, um, who runs it uh, several years back and uh, just through, you know, general acquaintances and, and uh, you know, for my twin sister and I, when you say kids, that's kind of our weakness. Like we bond, if you say kids and volunteer, um, we're not going to say no. So uh, we, we jumped in on some hunts and, and uh, it's a great organization. Uh, well, that, that is really neat because, you know, a lot of people that, well, you being an Olympian, you know, they focus just on their cells mm-hmm. and that's all they have time for is themselves. And for you to represent the United States and to do these things and to help other people too. It's awesome. Thank you. I echo that for sure. Um, so recently, and as I've uh, themed this show, an American Olympian, uh, the topic came up about U.S. Olympians bringing activism into their sport, particularly activism that appears to be maybe a little less than pro-American. So you put up a particularly thoughtful social media post about your own experiences being an Olympian for the United States. And uh, not just once, but multiple years. And so you've represented your sport and our nation. So to help people better understand the responsibility, if any, that our U.S. athletes have to represent with pride our country on the world stage, what what do you have to say about all that? I think the... The biggest thing that I have to say about that is when we put on the USA jersey, um, we represent the entire country. It doesn't matter political beliefs, religious beliefs, 
anything like that. We represent everybody from Alaska to Florida, from Maine to California, and we don't have a choice. That, that is our responsibility to represent every single person. Um, we were chosen uh, by the United States to go overseas and do the best we possibly can against other countries whose only job is to try to beat our country in, in a particular sport. Absolutely. And so, um, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but would you say that, you know, activism is fine on your own time, in your own personal space, but when you are on that stage, that world stage, even if the Olympics is, is held here in the United States, um, maybe that activism, even if it's pro-American, maybe that's just not the place for it. How would you, how do we square that? Yeah, so it's definitely a tricky conversation, you know, and it's, it's one worth having because, you know, people have debated for years, should Olympics be political? And there's been many years where it has been, you know, there's been years where the U.S. has, has chosen not to go uh, for political reasons. And there's been plenty of athletes who stood on the podium and, and made political statements and things like that. And, and you know, it, it, my opinion, but I, I strongly think that uh, on the Olympic stage, it doesn't matter what the country is, but our job is to participate in sports, not to bring awareness to certain, you know, political agendas or, or things like that. I mean, our, our job is to inspire people to push themselves to do whatever they want, whether that is in political activism or, or you know, whether it's to go to school or, or push themselves in sports and things like that. Our job is to inspire people um, to want to be their best and no matter what they do. Right, and Lanny, I, I agree with that. And when you, you know, if you go out there and do the best you can in the sports, you have everybody rooting for you. Whereas if you talk about a certain political thing, now you're going to divide your audience. You're going to divide your support mm -hmm. because some people are going to agree with you and some people aren't. So why not just go and play sports? Why not just go and, and support America? Absolutely. I think, you know, you said it perfectly. I think that when you represent the United States, you walk into that Olympic stadium behind the American flag as an American, as representing every single American. So, you know, that to me, there's no greater honor to represent your country and every single person in it and to have that weight on your shoulders of knowing that every single person in the United States is rooting for you. And you're supposed to go out there and do your best for them. I mean, it, do, it doesn't matter. Like I said, right. political views, it's, we just have to go out there and do our best for everybody. Yeah. Right. I, I actually have goosebumps listening to you because, you know, it is such an inspiring thing to see people, um, you know, whatever their, their station in life is, whatever their socioeconomic status is, who have worked and, and put in the dedication um, for whatever their sport is, or, you know, sometimes multiple sports, like you were a biathlon, you know, that's, you know, you got to be good at two things. I'm not even good at one thing. So <laughs> it, it is inspiring because it helps us want to tap into whatever our thing is that we are good at, even if it's not sports, it's, it's truly inspiring. And, and to have it you know, tamped down and put a, 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 you know, kind of a gray cloud over it because now, well, if you mention this, this uh, uh, athlete's name, well, now there's this political kind of thing attached to it instead of just being able to say, did you see what that guy or what that lady did that I, who could imagine that the human body could even do that? And it was, you know, multiple years of, of dedication. Yeah, I think with the, the Olympics, there's so many incredible stories. I mean, it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's not something that you're handed, you know, as an Olympic okay. athlete, you have to work your way up and it's, it's a lot of years and hard work and, and dedication and, and it's great to hear those stories. So when people watch sports, they don't want to, they aren't tuning in and they aren't um, watching them to get politics shoved down their throat like they do on a daily basis everywhere else. They, they exactly. tune into sports to, to get away from that and have a moment where they can 
get behind their team and get behind their athletes and, and enjoy something that's, that's pure love of sport and dedication and hard work. Absolutely. My goodness. You know, our family, it's a, a, maybe a funny segue here, but we love Disneyland. It is like a thing for us. You know, if you we're have, Olympians in the Disneyland, we are Olympians area. in the Disneyland <laughs> world. Uh, <laughs> I ran a 5k once it was not Olympic quality, but anyway, but part of the reason for us loving Disneyland is the story of Walt Disney and how he was always, you know, hanging on by his fingernails financially and, and, you know, pressing how much he could squeeze out of a day and the level of excellence that he um, expected and demanded out of um, his, his Imagineers, his workers. And that's inspiring to us. And so uh, to be able to go and enjoy that and be part of that and walk around the park that he built, um, you know, it's, it's a similar thing when we get to turn on the television, you know, every once in a while when the Olympics are even happening and get to see people who are performing at the top of their ability, it's, it, it's a beautiful thing that unlocks parts of our brains and, and helps us feel a solidarity with our fellow man, even across nations. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing I, that's a great example of, uh, you know, sharing Disney stories, because um, I'm a firm believer and you can do anything you put, you put your mind to. And for me, um, you don't have to be an Olympian in sports to be what I call an Olympian in life. Mm -hmm. You know, if you work your hardest at something, if you give everything you have and um, you dedicate yourself to something. To me, that's being an Olympian, you know, and so many people do that every day in business and in, in so many different things, you know, and, and what people don't realize is that a lot of times their struggle is just as hard as our struggle out there on the, in the arena. And it's, that's why people can relate. That's why people enjoy watching sports so much is because they, they see that, that, um, effort and that struggle and things like that. And, and in some way they can relate to that in their daily lives. And that's why they enjoy it so much. So beautiful. I love it. And so somehow, some way our nation's flag, right? We're supposed to be the United States, right? And our flag, the symbol of the uniting of these states has become in itself a political um, thing, statement, symbol. And it, it should, like our constitution, be for everyone. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's not a, a Democrat or a Republican or a left or a right uh, constitution. It's for all of us. And the flag is supposed to be the same. And so the flag features very prominently in the Olympics because, of course, each nation that we identify, you know, okay, this athlete is from China because there's that flag behind them. And this, you know, athlete is from Canada. There's that flag. This can, uh, this athlete is from America because there's the American flag. And now there's this, this, um, it almost feels like there are certain, uh, athletes who want to divorce themselves from the symbol. I just can't see how that can even work out. What are your thoughts on that? That's a tough one for me because I, I absolutely love our flag and, you know, our forefathers said liberty and justice for all and, and that's what it's for. The, I've spent so much time in countries where, you know, it, they, they have communism or socialism and things like that and I've seen firsthand how amazing we have it here in the United States having gone to those countries and, and experience um, the the lack of freedoms that they have. And I mean, we live in the greatest country in the world. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. And are we perfect? Absolutely not. But we strive for that every day and, and we're getting better and better every day. And I think that when, when an athlete says that they don't represent our flag and our nation, to me, that's pretty easy. You have a choice. You can, you can uh, go compete under, under the International Olympic Committee flag. Okay. As, as an independent athlete, you know, you okay. can, if you don't like our nation, you can go to another nation and compete. I, I knew Absolutely. several athletes that, um, and it, this wasn't necessarily the same situation, but they, they couldn't make the U S team. So they went and competed under, 
under another flag because they had whether they had dual citizenship or they they obtained it a different way and you know I would never do that even if I couldn't make the team because to me making the American team means more than than anything but you know those athletes that don't represent the United States and every single American in it they have a choice they can go represent another flag if they want to well that kind of looks like to me is that an athlete that wouldn't support the United States which is where they got all their tools to become what they became (laughs) Uh, just cares about themselves. They don't care about, you know, I, I believe that you are doing this for your country, not just for yourself. So when you see somebody do that, it's different. Yeah. I mean, as, as a, as a U.S. Olympic committee athlete, we take an oath to, um, you know, be the best, best Olympian we can be good, be great role models, you know, things like that. And, and, for most Olympians, they take that very seriously. And especially myself and my twin sister, we take being Olympians very seriously. I, you know, every single thing I do in my life, I always think of the consequences and the fact that there's probably a kid watching. Even if there isn't, I always think that there could be a kid watching. And and there's been a lot of situations in my life where um, I had role models disappoint me because of things that they did, you know, and, and you don't know how much influence you have over younger generations and all generations, but the fact that you do have that influence over people because you, you've you pushed yourself to those, those limits, you have to take that seriously and, and respect that and make sure that you are being a good role model and right. um, inspiring the next generation. Right, you have role models, whether it's positive or negative, mm-hmm. you have them. And it's up to you to decide how that goes, right? Yeah, each individual person, yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Gosh, I don't know if I'm going to get through this without tearing up. You are hitting all of my my heart buttons here. I mean, you talk about inspiring the next generation and how much responsibility we have to to be a bridge from one generation to the next and empower them. Uh, that's so much about the work that, that we do. And, um, when I hear somebody else get that to the level that you get that it's, um, it's touching. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, you know, I understand what you guys do and, and I'll, I'll get people telling me sometimes that I'm using my position politically to, to drive this second amendment narrative. And, and for me, what I tell people is, is yes, I, I want the second amendment around forever because I want the next generation to be able to do what I did. And it's my responsibility to make sure that they do. Absolutely. If, if I didn't, um, try to push for that and try to, to let kids have that opportunity, I'd be failing, failing them. I mean, it, it'd be the same as if, uh, you know, swimmers decided to just let people ban swimming altogether. You know, it's this, the same thing. I think that if a kid wants to, to follow in my footsteps, they should have every right to. Exactly that. I mean, who are we to leave our children and our children's children with fewer opportunities and fewer rights intact? So, you know, if that is, you know, pushing a second amendment agenda to preserve what people fought, bled, starved, and died to secure, okay, I guess maybe I'm guilty. Maybe you're yeah, guilty, but, but it's, it's about preserving the, the inheritance that we were given, not a political thing, because everybody wants to taint it with politics, the Second Amendment. Lanny, the, I think the difference is, I'm, I may be wrong here, but you know, you're up there you know, with a US flag behind, your, behind you, and you're supporting that flag, no matter what. And so if, if tomorrow they said no guns were allowed, you would still be up there supporting the American flag. What you do after you're off of that stage is different. Now you you have that window to, and you can even use your position to influence that. But on stage, kneeling because you don't like something that the Americans did or something like that is where it's wrong. But you have a right to voice. Everybody has a right to voice how they feel, just not on stage, mm-hmm. right? Not while you're doing that performance. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, um, that's been the debate for years that should athletes 
while they're at the Olympics competing, should they make political statements? And that's, you know, kind of what we talked about earlier. And I, yeah. I don't think it's the time and the place, Absolutely. you know. But trying so. to make America a better place, whatever, whatever you believe, you know, you have that right to do that. Mm -hmm. For sure. <laughs> so with the political firestorm that the Second Amendment has become, are we still even able to introduce shooting sports to our young people and how? You know, that's a that's an interesting topic because in some areas shooting sports are growing dramatically across the United States and it's it's really great to see and in other places uh, they're dying. So a lot of it has to do with what part of the country um, and it's a shame that it's a political divide because uh, you know, it, when I went to school, I, they taught gun safety and hunter's ed in school. So it was, it was just, it was just no different than the drug education programs and the sex ed and the, the driver's ed. And to me, I think that we should have hunter's education or, or at the very least gun safety in every school in America, because the, the only place where kids are, are having influence or, you know, any sort of introduction to firearms is in, you know, violent movies and violent video games and especially in cities and things like that. And, and to, to learn that respect, that healthy respect that, that all of responsible gun owners have for firearms, I mm -hmm. think that kids need to have that respect as well, you know, and learn the safety rules and things like that. So, um, that that's one of my goals is I you know I'd love to see every school in the United States bring back firearm safety so that we can teach things teach things properly and educate kids to to do the right thing when encountering a firearm or you know just making sure that they're safe right I think that parents need to think okay so I don't have a firearm so I don't need to worry about my kids with firearms if you use that like a pool I don't have a pool so I don't need to teach my kid how to swim. I don't have a pool, but the friend goes, he goes to his next door neighbor's house and they have a pool. Kids should know how to swim, right? Or there's canals and there's places. And it's the same with guns. Just because you don't like guns doesn't mean that kids shouldn't be taught empowered, how to be responsible. Empowered with yes. education and right. knowledge. Why would you deny your child that because you have this political idea about firearms? It, it really boggles my mind. Right. Yeah, I don't know if there's a exact count, but I want to say I saw somewhere where there's 300 million plus guns in the United States and, and you know, as, as parents, as, as a country that has a Second Amendment right, it's our responsibility to make sure that, that kids know how to handle firearms properly. Yeah. And if they want to, to use them in a positive way, such as, uh, you know, shooting sports or going to the Olympics or something like that, or representing their country in a, in a shooting sport that, that isn't in the Olympics, they should have that opportunity. Absolutely. Well, there's an event coming up. It's not the Olympics, but uh, where you and I get to actually see each other in real life again. It's been so many years since we've been in the same place at the same time. Uh, it's coming up in October in Texas, and it's called the She Never Quit event. Uh, I have never been, but I'm so excited. Uh, can you talk to us about what, and my daughter's coming with me as well, what will we experience when we get there? And uh, for the 2021 She Never Quit event, are there still opportunities available to people, tickets available? You know, so She Never Quit is an event put on by the Women's Outdoor Media Association, and it started... I should know this, but it started probably five or six years ago. It, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> it's true. The Women's Outdoor Media Association uh, is an organization, nonprofit, that started to promote women in shooting, hunting, fishing, and archery. There's plenty of organizations that promote men in those activities, and, and our, our goal is to promote women in, in those activities. And uh, about five or six years ago, um, Marsha Petrie-Sue and Deb Ferns met up with Melanie Luttrell, uh, 
Marcus Luttrell, the lone survivor's wife. And as, as you know, he has the, the Team Never Quit Foundation where he brings out wounded vets and things like that. And, and so um, Melody and, and Marsha and Deb, their idea was to create uh, She Never Quit for women. Um, you know, to, to raise money for widows of Navy SEALs and, you know, a lot of different female oriented organizations, um, because there's not as many out there uh, supporting, you know, women in combat or, or, or the, you know, widows of, of men who have, have, have died in combat and things like that. So um, we started this, this event and women come in from all over the country and it's three days of, of shooting all different guns, rifles, pistols, handguns. And if you've never shot before, it's no big deal because we, we bring in world-class instructors and uh, teach you all sorts of different things, how to shoot, how to compete, how to hunt, you know, anything like that. We've, years, we've had years where, you know, we've taught women how to back up a trailer, their self-defense. Um, you know, we, we teach you how to use mace if you want to, uh, so many different activities. Feels, feels. It's just a great kind of a girl's weekend. I, I absolutely love it. I'm so looking forward to it. So I have been shooting my whole life, just plinking. And lately I've been taking a lot more focused training and that is, it's amazing how it, it, um, it opens pathways in your brain. You know, it causes you to just think differently and, um, and, and it's wonderful to take focus training. I've been sh fishing before, you know, deep sea fishing. You were just recently deep sea fishing, oh, right? Yes. Yeah. I know, in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't go deep sea fishing. I get way too seasick. But, you know, I, I want to learn how to fly fish. Uh, but I've, you know, fished on. Wait a minute. I want to know. Did you catch fish? anything deep sea fishing? We did. Yeah. We caught. Uh, Grouper, snapper, yellowtail, uh, dolphin, all sorts of things. You notice how green with envy he's becoming as he's sitting here. <laughs> he loves well, we deep sea fishing. We fishing at, at She Never Quit. So we teach women how to fish there Can, as well. Teach her how and to not get seasick. I know, boat. I wish. But I have never, I've been, I've been hunting like with my dad and my brothers when I was young, but I've never actually hunted before. And archery, you mentioned, other than high school, shooting at, you know, in uh, physical ed class, it's all I've ever done with archery. So I am super looking forward to those things that are going to stretch me and grow me in ways just like with this focused training with firearms that I've been taking lately. I, I'm a little nervous maybe because I'm so unskilled, but I know I'm going to be in such great hands. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, just, uh, like you, there'll be women of all different backgrounds and skill levels and things like that. And, and kind of the idea behind she never quit was to create a, a friendly atmosphere where women can have that, that bond of, you know, maybe being a little bit nervous going into, you know, new activities, but at the end leaving as, lifelong friends. And like you said, we have archery and, and, um, Mia Anstein, she's, she's our instructor for that. She's absolutely phenomenal. And, and, uh, so yeah, I mean, there's lots of different activities and, and it does help raise money for a lot of different great women's organizations. That's awesome. Do you think there's any tickets left as we sit in the studio on Monday, July 19th of 2021? You know that there might be. You can go to the the WOMA, W V W O M A dot org, or she never quit dot org, and uh, sign up. We might have a wait list. Uh, it usually sells out pretty quickly, but um, if we do have some spots available, please get them quickly because, like I said, this event sells out every year. I absolutely cannot wait and. As an extra kicker, it uh, falls over my son-in-law's birthday. And so for my daughter to be able to break away and come with me, it took some, some major negotiations around the dinner table. Because <laughs> last year, everybody's birthdays were canceled. So, you know, because it's COVID. So this year, everybody's like excited that they get to go and do things. And I'm like, mm, maybe we'll just do your birthday on another weekend and you love me anyway. So moving on. Well, Lanny, this is awesome <laughs> because, you know, um, women were kind of blocked away from the shooting scenes 30 years ago. Mm. And 
even on the advocacy, advocacy? Mm -hmm. on it, they were blocked away from it. Once we started seeing that women were getting involved, it's like a storm. They're just, they're overpowering. They're taking over this industry, which is super good because we need that to protect our second amendment. Mm -hmm. So when I heard you say, they teach you how to back a trailer up. Mm -hmm. well, why can't you back a trailer up? Because they were they're introduced to it. Right. Why is it a, a guy thing that they have to be the one to back a trailer up? Is there something that a woman is not physically able to do? No. No. It's just, it's, so thank you. I, I, I think it's awesome because if we would have had this 30 years ago, we wouldn't be fighting for a second amendment right now because women have the power that men don't have. And that's to get out there and, and tell the world that guns are cool. Yeah. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Yes. It's amazing how many women, I mean, women they say are the fastest, fastest growing demographic in the firearms industry. And I think what a lot of women are, are finding out and realizing is that firearms and, 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 you know, going out to the range and shooting, it's, it's empowering. It, it makes women, um, feel stronger, feel more confident. Uh, you know, it's the, like a lot of people say, it's the ultimate equalizer. It's a, a great way of protecting yourself. You know, there's too many women out there have become victims to violent crimes and things like that. And, right. and you know, I've, I've been a huge proponent of, of women protecting themselves out there and, and you know, learning how to conceal carry and, and responsibly uh, getting the, the training so that you can, you can do that. And who wouldn't want that except for a criminal? Yeah. Right. right. It empowers the criminals when, when we're disarmed, right. good people are disarmed. So talking about all of our controversial issues we're talking about today and talking about the She Never Quit event where there's going to be uh, an opportunity to learn more about hunting. Uh, hunting, how did it become a controversial topic, right? Because pe people who understand and know, we see hunting as conservation but yet it's become this a controversial topic. Um, and here you're using hunting to help veterans and to help terminally ill children. So talk to us about that. It's, it astounds me that we've been hunting as, a, as the human species, we've been hunting longer than we've not been hunting. Yes. So to, to not hunt is almost as non-human as it is to hunt. So mm. it just, uh, you know, when, when people uh, attack hunters and, uh, you know, don't understand their way of life, it, it's, it's survival. I mean, it's, it's, it goes to back to one of the basic principles of survival. You need to eat in order to survive. And what I love about hunting is that it's not a for sure deal. <laughs> you know, you're not going to just go out there and get something every time. It, it's a challenge. It, you have to put in some work to, to put some meat on the table and, and uh, it's good organic meat. And what's great is seeing women jump into hunting now and, and saying, hey, I'm going to feed my family with the best quality meat that's out there. And uh, uh, I think that for a lot of people that are anti-hunting. I think it's more lack of education and the fact that they don't understand it mm. uh, that that probably drives that. And uh, you know, we just need to do a better job at educating people in the importance of hunting and, and what it does for conservation. Definitely conservation. But what does it do for these injured injured veterans and for these terminally ill children? What what are they? gaining when they go out on, on a hunting experience? It's, it's no different than when women are going to the range and, and shooting a firearm and overcoming that fear and learning, you know, that um, getting, I guess, that empowerment, yeah. you know, confidence with those, those, those vets and the terminally ill kids, uh, you know, it's memories, it's creating incredible memories. It's, um, gaining the confidence of going out and, and bringing home some meat to their family or, you know, a, achieving something great, going out and doing something very hard and very challenging yeah. and getting to that finish line and being proud of themselves. So that yeah. I think is what, what those, those vets and those kids get out of it. Absolutely. That's awesome. 
I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, just even when we um, uh, take our children out hunting or take our, our families out to the range, the things that kids are learning through those experience are, I mean, I don't even think you can quantify them, but definitely there's focus, there's follow through, right? There's responsibility, um, uh, you know, all these things that helps build maturity uh, in ways that I don't know that you can in other areas because, you know, even, all right, you sit down, you play a video game together as a family or a board game together as a family. It's fun. You're building memories, but it's a completely different thing than being out in nature. Absolutely. Some of the, the most important life lessons I've learned from hunting and probably one of the biggest is patience. Mm, when, you're, when you're out hunting or fishing, uh, you know, you're, you're dealing with wild animals or, you know, weather, mother nature, you know, things like that. And, and it takes patience to be able to uh, be successful in, in the field. And, and uh, you know, it's just, there's so many, like you said, there's so many great things that can be taken away from hunting and, and uh, you know, just being out in the woods, experiencing nature firsthand. Yeah, it's also, um, you know, teaching the grandkids, six-year-old granddaughter to fish is a lesson for both. It teaches patience <laughs> for, for the both, grandfather. For both. And, you know, so, I mean, it's really an important tool. And how to, how to unick the worm, you know, yeah, the idea yeah. of putting the worm on so, the hook. <laughs> yeah, so it is, uh, it, it's interesting for both sides. So, um, and it is a bonding thing. For it sure. is very important, so. Sure. Yeah, I'm learning that with the six-year-old right now. <laughs> that, that, how come they didn't catch a fish as soon as the water hit the line? You know, the, the line, the line hit, hit the water. water yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and so just as we start wrapping up, uh, walk us through what was your Olympic journey? And did you, did you and your sister, were you teammates every time you want, you've gone? Or how did that, how, how do you and Tracy interact in this Olympic world? Yeah, so the, our Olympic journey started in uh, probably 1998, 96 or 98. And it was basically one uphill battle after the other. I, you know, we look back on it and, and we're just, we always say it's, it's funny how we put ourselves through that. Like why, what, what, what was going through our mind? We must've been crazy. And, you know, we've gotten called crazy many times, but for us, it was, it was the challenge. I mean, we, we took a sport that we weren't any good at, you know, we were soccer players, we were excellent soccer players. And probably that was our goal is to go to the Olympics in soccer, but um, we discovered biathlon and tried to use it as a way of staying in shape for soccer. And, and um, I think because we were so bad at it, we're like, you know what, we're not going to quit this until we figure out how to do it and how to do it well. And, and that was, that was our journey pretty much until my last Olympic race where, um, you know, it can be summed up in, in basically we, we pushed ourselves to the, as hard as we could, and we tried too hard, <laughs> but it was an incredible journey. I mean, we made the 2006 Olympic team together. In 2010, um, we were both heavy favorites to make the team. And, and on the third race of the trials, uh, we woke up and it was so foggy that they canceled the third race. And unfortunately, Tracy had a good one and a bad one. And she needed that third one to make the team. And she didn't make the team. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, one of those things, just kind of dumb luck. It, I still to this day, I don't know why they didn't reschedule that, but um, she had that unique experience of watching from the sideline. It was, as an Olympian, it's devastating, you know, yes. to work that hard and then, and then sit on the sidelines and watch, um, especially because, you know, she felt she should have been there, but it was weather that didn't allow her to. So fast forward four years later and, you know, still heavy favorites to make the team and, and it flip-flopped. Um, I ended up getting sick right before the, the trials and, and Tracy had the best races of her life and made the team and, and, um, I wasn't able to because, you know, because I was sick mm -hmm. and, um, because of her experience in the 2010 Olympics, having been on the sidelines and seeing, seeing what that was like and having gone through that, she declined her spot on the team so that I could go oh. and Did basically you? gave her, her dream to me so that I could realize oh. mine and, um, oh my stars. 
And yeah. there we are again. I'm going to tear up. <laughs> and you guys, you guys, I mean, you're both driving and pushing each other to do the best that you can be. What better teammate to have than your sister? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's because you're going to have that for the rest, of, you know, for the rest of your life. They're going to, you're going to be together. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, a lot of people don't understand why she did that, but it goes back to um, this right here, the USA representing your country. And, and she did it because she felt that the U.S. should have the best team going to the, the games. And she thought that that should have been me. And, and wow. uh, you know, I didn't agree with her at the time because I wanted her to go. Sure, sure. But um, that just shows you how much she takes being Olympian seriously and how much she loves her country to give up her dream for someone else. That is amazing. So selfless. That is that is beautiful. Um, I did not know that story. And now I am so glad I asked that question. Uh, that, that's incredible. And so you were um, so you were actually in the Olympics uh, three times. Correct. Yes. And um, so when you say biathlon, what is, what are the two sports? It's cross country skiing and rifle marksmanship. So <laughs> at we, the same time? <laughs> <laughs> not at the same time. No, we actually stopped to shoot, but um, we, we cross country ski up and down hills, usually about a mile um, around a loop to the shooting range. And then we'll shoot prone, ski another mile to two miles um shoot standing and ski another mile or you know a couple miles to the finish that's kind of the basic gist of it but biathlon originated as a form of hunting on skis in scandinavia and then became a military tactic in world war one and world war ii and then in times of peace the countries would compete against each other and then that's how it became an olympic sport so when you say you you weren't particularly skilled at it, which one was the hardest one? Was it the skiing or the shooting? The skiing for sure. Uh, you know, we, we were shooters before that. We had competed in small board prone and hunted our whole lives. But the skiing, we were absolutely horrible. I mean, the, the only reason why we had a little bit of success early on was because every time we fell, we got back up and pushed even harder. It wasn't because we were any good at it. <laughs> But we have worked hard and eventually figured it out. And, and uh, you know, that's that's how we were able to to, you know, make make Olympic teams and have success. But um, yeah, we, we weren't good at it at all in the beginning. And that's one of those inspiring stories, because I so get that. Like I said, I'm taking this, uh, you know, very focused firearms training and realizing the things that I'm really not good at, but it doesn't defeat me. It makes me say, okay, so what do I need to, to do to improve? Because I am not going to not keep trying. And then I have people like you and your sister to inspire me that if you do continue on, you can push through so many mental barriers and maybe even physical barriers. And it's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. And that goes back to what I said earlier about I'm a firm believer in anybody, anybody can do anything they put their mind to, you know, and, and gotta be in the mind first though. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You look at Tracy and I, and we were horrible at biathlon. We weren't any good <laughs> and we had the passion and the desire and the work ethic to try to figure it out. And we put our mind to it and we made it to the Olympics. It's beautiful. I love it. All right. Well, how do people continue to follow uh, your journey and all of the amazing things that you continue to do? On uh, Facebook and Instagram, they can find me at Lanny Oakley. That's my, my nickname, a spinoff of Annie Oakley. <laughs> and I have a website, LannyOakley.com. I love it. I love it. I, uh, you know, I've always known you as Lanny Barnes. And so then I was like, wait a minute, is that your married name? Oakley? Like, what did I miss? <laughs> yeah. It's just a nickname. My, my dad gave me when I was really young, he called me Annie, uh, Lanny Oakley instead of Annie Oakley. And so that's that's awesome. fantastic. You know, I look at the kids, you know, the people that can't even eat at the same dinner table with their family mm -hmm. and for you to go through the hardships that you go with your sister, mm -hmm. what a bond that is. Yeah, for sure. It's beautiful. Yeah, we were very fortunate for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for all that you do. I look forward to seeing you in person in October in Texas at the She Never Quit event. Cheryl and Dan, it was a pleasure talking to you guys today. You too. Thank you Thank very you much. You bye bye. Too. Bye bye now. 
All right. My gosh, that was so fun. Yes, it was. Um, we could not even imagine how hard that would be. Yeah. I, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, you know, we've done a couple of shows about the Faster Saves Lives training, which is, it's tough training. Uh, and, and, you know, it's about the equipment you choose. You know, it's about, you know, your mental focus. It's about your physical, your grip. Is your grip right? Like, are all the stars aligned? And you know what doesn't lie to you? Your target. Right. Your target will not lie to you. It will tell you exactly. My target always moves. Mine does too. I don't right? know why. It, it moves so that everything hits like lower into the left generally. Mm -hmm. So, um, but even this, I'm finding out that, okay, so maybe my sights are a little bit. Um, They're off. A little they off. Are. They are. And so because I can get great groupings, I've got consistency, but there, it's always not right where I right. wanted it to be. It's a little bit low. And so you can only learn that through repetition, right? Right, And not giving up and not being frustrated. And uh, so anyway, going through these experiences and then to talk to an Olympian. Right. We don't even know what we're talking <laughs> about. Not like, even close. The discipline, the everything. Mm, yeah. It's too hot today. It's too cold today. It's oh my too. Gosh. And it's about to. their diet yeah. and their sleep and like everything comes into play. And then I'm looking back at my, my frustration with, you know, hitting the bullseye on that target. And I'm like, I, yeah. I need to just get back at it. That's what I need to do and stop feeling bad about myself. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's incredible. Um, I so appreciate being able to have a conversation about topics that could be controversial um, with someone that, you know, has had the experience and, and gone through all of the, the Olympic training and, and all of that. And, and not feeling like you have to shy away from having the difficult conversations. That is so right. valuable. And I really appreciate Lanny, uh, Lanny Oakley, Lanny Barnes for um, taking that time and, and chatting us through some of those things. And she's a great example of what, what the people that are, you know, influencing people, the, the ones that influence, uh, she's a great example of, of how to be because it's like, you know, when you start talking about political things that divide, then you're going to have a divided audience. Mm -hmm. You really are. I mean, it's, it's super important that, you know, we, you need to support what you believe in. Absolutely. But you don't need to do it on the stage. Absolutely. So picture, you know, you go to a, a concert and you want to see somebody and you go there and they're talking about things that you don't agree with. Mm -hmm. Is a concert going to be as fun? It's not, but if you're listening to them give an interview afterwards, you know, where it's not connected right. to where you spent time and got a babysitter right. and drove across right. town, then it might, it might open your mind to, well, I don't agree with what right. they're saying, but I've never really thought about the way that they're phrasing but it. But that's hard too, because and we've maybe seen I that. could think about something in a different way. So an actor doesn't act on that, you know, in the movie, maybe he's not going to act that way. But then after on after they're through, then they'll talk about things that you don't agree with and makes you not want to see the people in the movie. <laughs> you know, and I think that's about delivery more than anything, because if it's genuine to the person, this is I'm only speaking for myself. Because I understand that actors are paid to basically lie to us in a very convincing way, right? right? They they tap into our psychology and they know how to make <clears throat> us emote right? And feel the things that they're portraying and, and helping us relate to them. That's a skill that they have right. learned and honed, right? So there's a manipulation there. So when I see an actor and actress just kind of mouth piecing, I don't respect it at all. And it does kind of turn me off a right. little bit. But if it's something that they've had a personal experience with, that they've truly, you know, taken time to study it for themselves, and they're speaking from from their experience. Now, how do I really know? Because they're an actor, right? right? right, right. But um, you can get a sense or you can research the person's life and have a better idea of, you know, they're really speaking from their own thing. Now I can, okay, let me hear you. Let me see what you're saying. Um, because, you know, really, I think ultimately, most people when it comes to the Second Amendment and our rights, 
and you know whether guns are good or bad or whatever i think our, the core commonality is we just want what's best safest for us and the next generation and the people that are against it are not educated with the real issues of firearms that's the problem a lot of times that's but the case, but the, so. the point i'm getting at is okay let's say alec not not who's the guy that uh in new york the mm, de niro de niro robert de niro okay so i, I used to like robert so de niro weird, i used to go to last election i used to go to all his show movies mm -hmm. and i was excited to see the next movie now i won't go to a single movie he has well, he i won't even weird. i won't even see movies that he did way back yeah, i'm done with him shouting and so, expletives about so, how trump right. is so bad it's like it right. didn't feel genuine so why at all so why would you divide yourself because the people that like you are going to see you mm -hmm. and the people that don't know you're you know you're trying to force feed this stuff down there are going to see you mm -hmm. but what do you do you lose an audience mm -hmm. and maybe they have so much money and so much they don't care anymore mm -hmm. but he is not educated mm -hmm. with his issues that's the problem. That's he is, the way he comes across right. anyway. He's and he's not. a better actor than that. So right. if he's anyway. terrible, he's I, terrible in real life. He may be a good actor on screen, but he's terrible in real life. Yeah. looks like I got the look. It's time to go. Yeah. <laughs> I reached down, tap my phone to check the time. He, yeah. And then she gives me that look. She gave me that look. <laughs> Show me that look. There it is right there. <laughs> I don't think that was really the look. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, today, people, we, it's been fun. Absolutely. Awesome conversation. Thank you so much to Lanny Barnes, an American Olympian. Yes. Uh, thank you so much to our listeners who are all over the globe, not even part of the United States, but yet curious about what our subject matter experts have to say, and then taking those conversations into your homes and into your lives and discussing them with your, your significant other, your relatives, your, your children. That's everything. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Your time is your most valuable commodity. And when you spend it with us, it's noticed, it's appreciated. We thank you for that. Um, if you've missed any portion of this show or any of our shows and you like to watch it on video, then you can go to YouTube as long as we're still there and still allowed to be there uh, to Gunstreamer, which is a YouTube like uh, site uh, where videos uh, are posted. Uh, gunstreamer.com or also the smartphone app called OpsLens. And if you like to listen to the audio only version uh, as you're out doing other things, you know, running errands in the car or that sort of thing, then go to our website, gunfreedomradio.com. Click the on demand tab. And what do they do, Dan? You can binge listens to your heart's content, darling. Exactly. Well, you almost looked exactly like me when you I did that. I felt like it too. And if you uh, click on the guest tab, you can see photos and bios and links to all the works that all of our guests have. And it's a tremendous resource. And when you spend time there, we don't hate it, do we, Dan? Nope. nope. We don't hate that don't at all. Know. All right. Until next time, please pray for our nation. Pray for the Olympians from all nations who are going through their own breakthrough moments, their own struggles to, to really you know, be the best that they truly can be. Um, pray for the people in, in our nation that have been placed in positions of leadership. Mm, even the leadership, ones you don't leadership. particularly you like. Leadership, representativeship. Okay, representativeship. But uh, even the ones you don't like, maybe especially the ones you don't like. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I'm thinking. Thinking. I'm thinking. <laughs> He'll get back to I'll us on back, that. So. Are you going to circle back? I'll circle back with that. To yeah. us on that. First, I have to find out if they've been blocked from uh, uh, social media and um, all that stuff. Yeah. You know, and all that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I have comments about that, but I will hold them because we are out of time. You know the so thing. Until, you, know, you know the thing. The thing. The thing. That, until next that time, we'll be good to each other. Have a great week. And God bless. God bless you.